<laughs> there will never be enough puppy pictures. <laughs> so that's a super cute puppy. That puppy, this, if you're not already hurting with the pain of the cuteness, that puppy is like eight pounds. Aww. That's how little she is. All right. I, I can look at that puppy all day long. Oh, oh, no. Don't you just want to smell it? <laughs>
anyone who's never had chicken pox would get chicken pox first, it would reemerge the shingles potentially if you're, if you're older. There are some great vaccines for shingles. Let me talk about, I'll do this first. Um, so shingles is, is usually much harder on people than chicken pox. Usually people get chicken pox, they're young kids, they bounce back pretty quickly. Uh, but shingles, because they, again, it affects people who are older or immunocompromised, uh, they end up with that rash, it's in the nerves, and so it can be really a painful rash. And even after the rash is healed, people often have this post herpetic neuralgia, which is basically kind of a long-term, months-long, fairly serious pain where the rash was. And it can be a pretty miserable experience. I've known people who had shingles, and they said it was just incredibly painful. It's like you can't go to work because it hurts so bad. Yeah. Are there any other reasons why someone might develop shingles, like their immune system is fine and they don't have <laughs> HIV? You could just be bad luck. And, and a fine immune system is relative, right? Yeah. So you could be someone who's very healthy and very young and just have, you were going, undergoing a particularly stressful final exam week. Um, and, and it managed to kind of escape your immune system. I think there's a certain amount of that. But we certainly see it. So, so these events can always happen, but they're going to be more associated with a weakened immune system. Pregnancy is a state of weakened immunity uh, because you've got a parasite you're incubating, and your immune system has to be suppressed so you don't kill it, right? That's for later. Yeah, kill it. Even more later. Okay. Um, all right, so per post herpetic neuralgia is more severe and higher risk as you get older. Um, and it can occur in about about third of people who are 60 years and older. So this actually is a really important thing to try to avoid. And it's another reason, it seems like it's too late for most of you, but get your kids vaccinated against the chicken pox. Um, shingles, there's actually a vaccine for shingles. It's not the same vaccine as the chicken pox. And there's a fairly new vaccine for shingles. And I should have put it up here because I can't remember the name of it, but they've actually got a really good new vaccine that's very expensive that I know I will be asking if I need and asking for, even though I can't technically get shingles, it will still protect you from getting the chicken pox, I think. Um, anyway, the shingles, yes? What percentage is it supposed to be effective? Because my mom had the vaccine and still got shingles. Yeah, so the new one's supposed to be better. I'm not sure what the actual numbers are, but um, yes. You can have the vaccine and still get shingles. You can get vaccinated against the chicken pox and still get chicken pox. You can get vaccinated against the measles and still get measles. When we talk about these vaccines, they're 90, you know, good vaccines are 95 percent effective. That means five percent of people could still be undetected, right? Can you get vaccine if you have chicken pox? So I don't know, and actually I'll be finding out in a few years. <laughs> I'll know the answer to that personally. I don't know that you need it if you haven't had the chicken pox, to be honest. Uh, they might not want to give it to you, or they might do it as a, as a precaution anyway. I'm actually not sure. So basically, when you go to the doctor and ask about these things, they're going to either know or they're going to look it up on the CDC's guidelines and figure out what, their, what the website says. And I don't know if a shingles vaccine is indicated as someone who they're confident has to have the chicken pox. Up until, what did I say, 1995, there was no vaccine for chicken pox. And so for right now, a lot of people, like everyone in their 60s, right, who would be um, a candidate for the shingles vaccine, all of those people were not vaccinated. So, they may just be doing everybody right now. There's going to come a point where you're going to have that cohort of people who, who had the opportunity to get vaccinated and get to that age, and then the, the, the rules may change. All right, um, pain medication, white compresses, calamine lotion, and colloidal oatmeal might help with itching. It's just not pleasant to uh, experience varicella zoster in any form. Our next disease is cholera. Just another fun one. But let's talk, let's, let's, now we've talked about some fun things, let's do some work on uh, metabolism. And um, and then we'll come back and we'll continue on the time and we'll do cholera next time. All right. So last time we were talking about, did we talk about ATP? No. We did not talk about ATP. Okay. So, um, Let's talk about ATP brief, briefly, and then we'll talk about we'll get going and talk about glycolysis. Uh, we were talking about enzymes last time and pathways, and we talked about um, uh, the idea that there are catabolic pathways and anabolic pathways. Typically, these catabolic pathways, glycolysis and cramped electron transport are all catabolic pathways. Typically, they 
they have a goal, and that's to break down molecules and get energy from them, right? All right, so um, how do cells get energy? Well, they really collect their energy in the form of ATP. So if you want to think about ATP sort of like, you know, the, the cash that the cell operates in. It's the currency of the cell. And when you eat nutrients, the energy that gets released is used to produce ATP. And so here is an ATP molecule. It's got an adenine like in DNA. It's got a ribose sugar. For those of you that are DNA experts, you know the DNA is deoxyribose. So ribose is like RNA. And then it has either one AMP, two adenosine diphosphate, or three adenosine triphosphate uh, phosphate groups on it. And the more phosphates it has, the more energy that is released. And so uh, this first uh, phosphate that comes off releases the most energy. And this ATP is often converted to ADP and then used, the energy that's released is used to drive chemical reactions in the cell. So your cells want to have lots of ATP on hand because it's how they pay for all the work that they need to do. Yeah? But they have to make ATP by undergoing metabolic pathways like glycolysis. So what we want to do is study glycolysis. Cells have lots of pathways. So why do we focus on glycolysis? Well, it's a very ancient pathway. The oldest cells used it. The enzymes that you have for undergoing glycolysis are very similar to the enzymes that bacteria have. And the fact is it's the main pathway for producing energy for the cell. And many of the other pathways, metabolic chemical pathways in the cell actually branch off glycolysis. So once you learn glycolysis, it's kind of the beginning of learning all about cellular biochemistry. If you're a photosynthetic cell, which we're not going to be focusing on, um, I should mention that we can actually capture energy from the sun to make ATP, and that's called photophosphorylation. Thinking about those autotrophs, right, they're self-feeding. They can actually take sun, take energy from the sun, and turn it into ATP, and so they're able to get ATP which is pretty nifty. All right. So let's talk about cells making ATP and how they do it. And we're going to talk about actually four main ways that are part of the process. Um, when the cells break down glucose, we talk about that as a part of carbohydrate metabolism. Because glucose is a carbohydrate. And they break down glucose in the presence of oxygen in three stages. So they go through glycolysis, Krebs, and then electron transport system. If bacteria don't have oxygen and they're able to, they will also undergo something called fermentation, which involves glycolysis and then a, and then a second step. And in the second step, um, some bacteria and yeast can make alcohol and CO2, or they can make lactic acid. There's actually lots of different byproducts of fermentation, but those will be the two that we focus on. When a cell is making energy, it's undergoing all of these things all at the same time. But we're going to talk about them in steps. And we're going to start with glucose, and we're going to convert our glucose <coughs> molecule all the way to carbon dioxide and water, and then talk about where all the, where all the energy is captured along the way. Okay. Um, how many of you feel really comfortable with glycolysis, Krebs, and electron transport? You've learned it a bunch of times. I don't see lots of hands. So. Okay, so we'll, I'm, gonna go through, I'm not going to make you memorize lots of specifics, but we're going to learn the big picture idea. Before we get going too far, um, I want to talk a little bit about why we go through all these chemical reactions. Just for a minute. I'm going to turn this off and then back on again. Uh, okay, so remember yesterday, not yesterday, we were together yesterday. Remember um, Tuesday when we were talking about, um, I've got a new color We were talking about my beaker of glucose and how you can incinerate it and get energy from it, make CO2 and water, uh, but it doesn't do that spontaneously. And we said, isn't it nice that you, know, you guys don't have to get to incineration temperatures to metabolize the glucose, right? So there are some advantages to this stepwise. You know, I'm going to make you learn all these steps, right, or make you understand the steps. So let me explain why these steps are so important. Um, here's, here's, our, here's our man, and he's at the Grand Canyon. Colorado River's down here. But there's some rocks here, too. 
You know something bad's gonna happen, right? <laughs> All right. So tell me about the kind of energy he has. Does he have kinetic energy right now or potential energy? Potential energy. energy. Ah, okay, and we're gonna give him a shove. Oh, yeah. <laughs>
to an intermediate called pyruvic acid. That's the end of glycolysis. Okay, this intermediate called pyruvic acid. In the presence of oxygen, we call this respiration. And the pyruvic acid, or pyruvate, which is the same thing, will uh, get converted to a molecule called acetyl-CoA in something that I call the bridge step. So we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Acetyl-CoA enters the Krebs cycle, and in the Krebs cycle, all of the carbons get converted to CO2. One of them gets converted in this step, and the other ones get converted in Krebs. At the end of the Krebs cycle, you've made some ATP, you've made some CO2, you've made, you've made all the CO2 you're going to make, you've made some ATP, and you've made high energy NADH and FADH2 molecules. These go into the electron transport chain, and lots of ATP gets generated as does water. My big picture summary, the whole step. So what we're going to do today is focus on glycolysis, and we might get to part of the Krebs cycle as well, and talk about the key steps and what they do and why they do it. You know, just because you hated this in high school doesn't mean it will be bad in, in life. I just want you to have an open mind. Glycolysis and Krebs cycle. All right, here's a summary of glycolysis. Just a review, right? In glycolysis, we start with glucose and we end with two molecules of pyruvate or pyruvic acid, depending on who's writing the book. Okay, so this is our summary. So we're just looking at that first step now, glucose to pyruvate, right? And we're going to break it down into, um, we break it down into three phases. So we have an energy investment phase, an energy liberation phase, and a cleavage phase. And what we want to do is talk about all of these steps. And the first thing I want to do is point out that in the very beginning, uh, it looks like we're putting ATP into the reaction. Do you notice that? We're using ATP. Are you horrified? We're supposed to be, I just told you, we're going to be making ATP and here we are using some up. What a terrible thing. <laughs> terrible, terrible waste. If you're frugal, it probably really bothers you. We're using ATP here in the first step. All right, let's talk about that first step. All right, so we have the energy investment phase and the energy payoff phase. Why does the cell use up ATP to initiate glycolysis? There are three main reasons why we're going to use some ATP at the very beginning. Trust me, at the end we're going to get, this is sort of like investing your money, right? You're going to put the money in and hopefully you're going to make a lot from your investment. So think of it like that, that's why they say investment phase. When you put glucose into a cell, the first thing that's going to happen is the cell is going to put a phosphate on it. And I want you to go back to your understanding of diffusion for a moment. Molecules like to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, right? That's spontaneous. If I have glucose diffusing into the cell and it, and it stays in the cell, at some point I'm going to have the same amount of glucose on the inside and the outside. And there's going to be no longer a gradient forcing its diffusion into the cell. But if I stick a phosphate on it immediately, I'm changing it, right? There's no longer any more glucose in the cell. By putting a phosphate on the glucose, it means that there's never glucose inside the cell. There's glucose six phosphate, but there's never phosphate in the cell. Or right? never glucose in the cell. And that means there's always this concentration gradient from high, there's always higher glucose outside the cell than inside the cell. Because the cell immediately puts a phosphate on it, changes it. So there's essentially never glucose in the cell. It's always pulling glucose in. What do you think? Questions? So this is happening while the glucose is going through the cell membrane? So as the glucose goes through the cell membrane, basically there's a welcoming committee there saying, phosphate for you, phosphate for you, right? So the minute it comes in, it gets a phosphate, it's no longer glucose. And now that means that more glucose will come in. And there's always more glucose outside than inside. So you're forcing there to always be a concentration gradient driving glucose in. Yeah? How are we doing now? I'm looking at people who weren't nodding before. Yes? So would it form a phosphate glucose complex? Or it's just like still different molecules, but just So they're different together. molecules. As soon as you put a phosphate on the glucose, it's no longer glucose. OK. It becomes a different molecule. It's called glucose 6-phosphate. It's similar, but that's still a concentration gradient. It will still be driving the, the flow of glucose in. 
Yes. Wait, you said by adding glucose there's another phosphate that was said By adding a phosphate to the glucose, oh, okay. I'm, I, I'm misspeaking of you. By adding a phosphate to the glucose, you never have glucose in the cell. There will always be a concentration gradient. There will always be more glucose on the outside. All right. Are you ready for the next reason? Is that the investment of the So this is, this is, there's three reasons why we're going to stick phosphates on that. We're using it for ATP. I'm trying to justify it. Because I know you guys are sitting here saying that's a really bad idea. We're supposed to be making ATP, not using it, right? So I'm trying to convince you that it's a good idea for the cell to spend all this ATP. So it's going to force a concentration gradient to always exist, where there's more glucose outside than inside the cell. Uh, before you, you brought up the issue of uh, glucose binding with uh, the phosphate, I was thinking more ATP being used to sustain the glucose inside the cell in the form of uh, active diffusion. So it's, it, this is facilitated diffusion. So the cell does not have to use ATP to bring glucose in. Okay. It, as long as it's at a higher concentration outside the cell, it will spontaneously come in. But it makes that always be the case by changing. The, it never leaves glucose in the cell. It always just changes it to another molecule. What did you call that molecule that it's changing it to? So it changes it to glucose 6 phosphate. And you, I'm not going to make you memorize all the intermediates. I've had to do it. And I don't think my life is that enriched. <laughs> <laughs> if you take bi senior level biochemistry, you can learn it. <laughs> all right. Ah. OK, so that's the first reason. The second reason is because remember we talked about transporters, protein molecules that sit in the membrane and they're tunnels, and they have molecules come through. Mm -hmm. So the tunnel that lets glucose come through, theoretically, glucose could come back out, right? Mm -hmm. But if you stick a big old phosphate group with a negative charge on there, it traps the glucose in the cell, too. Mm -hmm. and this one was easier conceptually to get, <laughs> right? So now we've, we've not only have we forced there to always be a concentration gradient bringing glucose in, but we've basically trapped the glucose because now it's stuck inside the cell. It can't get back out its transporter. It doesn't fit anymore. Okay? And the third reason is when you add the phosphate group to glucose, it actually destabilizes the molecule. So now this molecule is less stable and it's easier to break it down, which is what we want to do next. Okay, so adding phosphate makes a less stable molecule that's more reactive. It's going to be easier for enzymes to begin the process of breaking it down. So we have three really good reasons why we're going to add, why we invest energy at the beginning of glucose. You know, why do we have this energy invested phase? This is why. Um, here's our glucose molecule. Notice that in step one we add a phosphate and we add another one in step three. And at the end we have a very symmetrical molecule with a phosphate on one end and a phosphate on the other. And this molecule is called fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, or diphosphate. And you do not need to know the names of the intermediates. Um, you need to know glucose. All right. I'm going to go to the next step. All right. The next step is we're going to cut this molecule in half. A lot of violence in this lab. This mm -hmm. We're going to chop it in half. So here we go. So we cut, remember I said it was symmetrical? So when you cut this in half, we end up with two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Two identical molecules. For those of you that have taken, learned about glycolysis before, you might know and be saying, how come you're not talking about dihydroxyacetone phosphate? Because it turns out that one of these is actually turned immediately into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. One becomes dihydroxyacetone phosphate and then gets changed into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. You don't need to know that, but if you, I don't want you to be confused if you've learned that step before. Uh, at the end of the cleavage phase, you have two molecules of glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Questions so far? So we had a six carbon molecule, and now what do we have? We have two three carbon molecules. Do we still have six carbons? We do, right? Because two times three is six. It's funny, these are simple math problems, but when you throw a bunch of other chemicals in here, they sound hard, right? I'm trying to convince you it's not that hard. Six carbons, three carbons plus three carbons is six carbons. All right, so we still have all six of our carbons in our two uh, glyceraldehyde three phosphate molecules. All right. All right, now you're feeling better because now we're going to start reaping the rewards of our big investment. This is the energy payoff phase. I think one of the reasons that 
And glycolysis gets challenging as people think that we start with one molecule and then halfway through we're tracking two molecules. But we're really just doing everything twice because we have two three carbon molecules and they're going to go through exactly the same pathway. I'm going to see if it's spider on here because it's uh, Which one, which one has more hydrogens? 